Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Celine Gounder. I'm the host of this show in Sickness and in Health. If you like our approach to health storytelling, do me a small favor. This week, tell one friend about the podcast. Just one. Not a big ask, right? It'll help us bring you more stories on the big health issues of the day. Thanks for listening. Now, on with the show. Well, that day, uh, Chris and I spent the whole day together. We were all home and ordered pizza and wings and just, just having a good time like we normally do on a Saturday night. Then the phone started ringing. So I kept asking, who's calling? Like, he's like, oh, there's some girls, you know. So he said, I'm talking to a girl. I said, well, guess what? If the girl call again, you're not leaving. Well, y'all could go across the street where I could see you because it's almost your curfew time. He, um, you know, put some grease on his hair and pushed it up in a ponytail, put his jacket on, got cute, and uh, went outside. Welcome back to In Sickness and In Health, a podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This season, we're looking at gun violence in America. The woman you're hearing is Serena Cotton, talking about her son, Christopher. Christopher Sea Snake Bougie Jones. So I looked outside and I saw Chris sitting on the stairs and there was three girls standing there, you know, like they were just talking or whatever. I went upstairs. I heard a lot of commotion and first I was just sitting there and then I thought about it. I was like, wait a minute, Chris is still outside. So I looked out the window and there was a car parked across the street that was still running and it was a lot of people outside. I ran out the door in my, just my nightgown, the uh, one that had the gun, the person was getting out the truck and coming around the truck and that's when he pulled the trigger. On November 17th, 2007, her 17-year-old son Chris was shot outside their home. He died. Serena was devastated, and even more so when she learned why her son had been shot. The one girl that liked it, Christopher, lied to Chris. She got on the stand and told the truth. Her cousin came to fight Christopher because he assumed Chris knew her age. She lied and told my baby she was 16. She was only 12. So that's why her cousin was setting it up for to fight Chris. And Chris died not even knowing the girl's real age. Serena has three other children. Two of them have also been shot. But they survived. She says they were all good kids, didn't do drugs, didn't get in trouble. But somehow, they couldn't escape the violence. It wasn't until after Chris died that Serena realized how prevalent gun violence was in her community. And she began to wonder, was there anything she could do about it? In today's episode, we'll look at the science of soft policing. We'll look at the direct and indirect ways in which neighborhood groups can curb gun violence. And why getting the community mobilized around these issues turns out to be so important to the work. We'll come back to Serena's story. But first, let's take a step back. On this show, we've talked about how violence intervention programs like Ceasefire or Cure Violence work with individuals who are at highest risk of being involved in violence. Right now, today, or tomorrow. And what they need. But what about the next concentric circle out? People who are at medium risk. Let's say a young teenager. He's got some risk factors. Mom's a single parent struggling to make ends meet. Or dad is incarcerated. But this kid, he's still in school and still engaged. He's not involved in the violence. At least, not yet. Nonprofit and community-based organizations offer social services and other supports that address many of the social drivers of violence. They help prevent violence from spreading, but do so by taking a, quote, softer approach, rather than a hard arrest and lock em up strategy. We're going to look at one program that seeks to prevent situations, like the one that led to Chris's death. The Becoming a Man program is a program that is run by a local uh, nonprofit in Chicago called Youth Guidance. This is Harold Pollack. He's a professor of social service administration at the University of Chicago. The program he's talking about, Becoming a Man, is a school-based group intervention for junior high school and high school boys. 
becoming a man teaches the social and emotional skills these boys need to cope with life's challenges. One of the most important challenges they face is, is violence prevention, uh, avoiding being either the victim or the perpetrator of violence, which in Chicago, of course, is a very significant problem. Part of Harold's job is to evaluate how effective violence prevention programs like Becoming a Man really are. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. We've talked before about how most urban violence in the U.S. is driven by a very small group of people, adult men who've already been heavily involved with the criminal justice system, not high school-aged youth. Ceasefire and cure violence are about the here and now. Becoming a man is relevant to long-term violence reduction because of the type of work they do with teenage boys. The key here is you've got to target the right people at the right time with the right intervention. We all have scripted behaviors that we use to get through the day. Most of our interactions with people in our day-to-day -day lives are pretty automatic. It would be hard to get through the morning if we had to stop and carefully analyze every situation before responding. So we've developed these scripts. They often work pretty well for us, but that sometimes can go really badly if we're reacting automatically in a situation where if we were just a little bit more reflective and stopped to think, we might behave quite differently. Let me put you into the headspace of a 17-year-old uh, Chicago high school junior. Many of the teenagers becoming a man works with are used to putting up a tough guy front. I've got this sort of tough exterior that I use to deter people from trying to take advantage of me and trying to hurt me. That becomes their script, one they use to interact with other 17-year-old boys. In many cases, it's a defense mechanism that has served them well, at least till now. A tough guy script may, for example, signal to a bully at school that he's not to be messed with. Now let's think about how that automatic script can go wrong. So I walk in late into English class, and my English teacher gets in my face, and she's mad because I'm late. You know, she's in my face in front of my friends. She's kind of humiliating me and treating me like I'm a little kid. And, of course, I've got this script of how I respond to other 17-year-olds. And I'm also, I'm a, you know, I'm a 17-year-old boy. I've got testosterone pulsing through my body. I'm, I curse out the teacher, and I go storming out of the classroom. If I could have stopped myself, slowed myself down a little bit, I might have been able to navigate that situation better. And that, Harold says, is what becoming a man helps them do. What I need in that moment is not somebody lecturing me, like, don't curse out your teacher. I kind of already know that. But it's like, how do I, in that moment, execute that and remember, oh, yeah, it's a really stupid idea for me to curse out my teacher right now when I'm pumped and uh, about to uh, act impulsively. Band kids, what they often need is an adult man to say, uh, yeah, that's a tough situation. Let's, let's game out how you can get through that. Let's think about what was really going on in that teacher's mind when she was in your face. Becoming a man helps students consider the situation from the other person's perspective and consider all the choices they have before reacting. It gives them a positive male role model. In essence, a new script. I want this kid to learn how do I feel my emotions, understanding that emotions have a place. There's nothing wrong with being angry. There's nothing wrong with the emotions that you feel. But when your emotions control you and they prevent you from thinking strategically in important situations, they can do you a lot of harm. If what drives urban gun violence is interpersonal conflict, emotions running high, people making rash decisions and reacting badly with a gun, then what becoming a man offers these kids are powerful tools that can, hopefully, serve them in the long run if they ever find themselves in triggering situations. Becoming a man participants meet once a week with a coach, usually a young man, perhaps of a similar background to theirs, someone students can relate to. During each session, they do a series of exercises and reflection. On day one, the first item of business is the golf ball exercise. You pair off the kids. So, uh, you know, Harold and Frank are paired off, and the mentor gives Frank a little golf ball. And he says, Harold, your job is to, uh, to get that golf ball. Go. Most kids, Harold says, will inevitably start hitting one another, wrestling for the ball until the mentor stops the fight. And then the mentor says, stop, stop, stop. And then he says, hey, Harold, did you ask Frank for that ball? He says often the kids are surprised. 
well, you didn't tell me that there was like rules or anything. Um, you know, Harold's like, I'm bigger than Frank, so I thought I could get it. Or Harold says, yeah, I asked him. I said, give me the blanking ball. Uh, and of course, Frank said, forget it. And uh, so then it escalated from there. And then the mentor turns to Frank and he says, Frank, how would you have responded if Harold had just said, hey, Frank, can you, uh, can you just hand me the ball for this exercise? And Frank's like, oh, I would have given him the ball. What's the big deal? After the ball exercise, kids are given an assignment to find an adult in the school building and get them to do something that they want him or her to do, a favor. They then come back to class and let the group know who and how they persuaded to do this favor. It may sound simple, but the exercise teaches them important lessons they haven't learned before. It's getting people to think about other people's, uh, what other people uh, need to get out of situations. Getting the kids to appreciate, hey, I was reacting automatically in a way that wasn't necessary. And if I ask someone for a favor in a way that is disrespectful or trying to be dominant over them, they're, they're not going to do what I want them to do. There have been several studies of Becoming a Man and other programs like it. According to Harold, the results in terms of violence prevention are pretty encouraging. What we found in that study was roughly a 40% reduction in arrests for violent offending among the young men. We also found other benefits, like kids were more likely to stay on track for graduation. Harold was surprised. In a way, I found that actually very sad because BAM is a once a week group counseling intervention. And if the kids were living in an environment that were meeting their needs, we would not have seen a 40% reduction like that. To me, that was a symptom of how much these kids need that we have failed to give them. Becoming a man costs about $2,000 per kid. It's a relatively inexpensive program as far as these things go. This means it's accessible and relatively easy to scale up. And for Harold, this is key. I think it's really important to give people a, a sense of realistic evidence-based optimism, that we can do something about the violence problem. You know, everyone across the political spectrum is sad about the high level of violence that we see in many cities across America. But I think that many of us are not convinced that we have available, feasible strategies that can really do much about it. There are lots of youth programs out there, Midnight Basketball, for instance, which help take kids off the streets. But most don't teach the social and emotional skills these kids need to survive. And that's what makes becoming a man special. But there are other indirect ways in which local organizations can help curb gun violence, engaging a broader swath of the community. Organizations that look out across a community have the capacity to see what is happening in the neighborhood before it happens, to see if the space looks like it's becoming a space where problems emerge, where people are not safe, where kids are hanging out unsupervised. This is Patrick Sharkey. He's a professor of sociology at New York University and does research on urban policy, equality, and violence. All of these organizations can get directly involved and, and directly try to reduce violence, but they also play a role of just looking out over public space, making sure that everyone who enters that space is cared for, making sure that uh, violence cannot emerge, drug distribution doesn't emerge, and this can be a very indirect process. Hello, Dominican Center. Uh, yes, hi, this is Celine Gounder calling for Patricia Rogers. This is she. Hi, Patricia, how are you doing this evening? I'm okay, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to me today. Sure. Sister Patricia Rogers is the executive director of the Dominican Center in the Amani neighborhood of Milwaukee. Before that, Patricia was a teacher at an alternative school for girls and had long been interested in education and community engagement. She says it's thanks to her mother. That's where my activism really came from, and it's been kind of ingrained in me. Patricia remembers growing up in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Her mother was an active member of the NAACP and would take her kids with her to marches and demonstrations. She would check in on sick neighbors on her way home from work and would open her home to other kids in the neighborhood at mealtime. The women that I grew up around just didn't see a limit between their families and the, and the next family. They were all part of the same fabric. 
The Dominican Center was founded in 1995 by two Cincinnawa Dominican sisters. Cincinnawa Dominicans believe that relationships are at the heart of their ministry. In the beginning, it was just women that they worked with. They did uh, art, they did dance, they did poetry, and just to find out what the women in the community were like and what were their wishes. And they soon found out that what the women in Amani really wanted was to become homeowners. So the Dominican Center shifted its work to support Amani's women in working towards that goal. Through that, there was a real relationship that they built throughout this neighborhood. And that's why the Dominican Center now teaches homeowners how to repair their homes, bring them up to code, and how to prevent lead exposure in drinking water and paint. They teach financial literacy about taxes, insurance, maintenance, and utilities. They've even got a landlord training program. A few years ago... We were doing a project that was called Painting with a Purpose. Neighbors wanted to address urban blight in Amani. The whole idea behind the program was to not just have the houses boarded up, but to at least try to make them look as if maybe someone lived there. And so on the houses, there would be a plywood board laid over all of the windows, and they would paint the boards so that it looked like curtains were on the windows. And then they would put plywood over the doors, and paint those as if, you know, it was a door. And the whole idea was to try to cut down on vandalism in those houses and at least give the appearance in the neighborhood that, you know, it wasn't as bad as it seemed, that something was happening to these houses. Beyond making old houses look beautiful, what Painting with a Purpose did was to give the community control, to empower them to take back their neighborhood. Who's in charge of a given street or block or any public space? Patrick Sharkey again. You get a sense of that when you walk through a neighborhood and get a feel for whether it's a space that is outside the control of of any neighbors or police officers or security officers or whatever it might be, or whether there's some element of the community that kind of Uh, takes responsibility for that space. One way of taking responsibility for that space, says Patrick, is through broken windows policing. Yeah, so the original broken windows theory argued that when there are signs of disorder... Like broken windows, overgrown weeds in an abandoned lot, or litter... Then that space becomes more vulnerable. Vulnerable to violence and other crimes. People come to believe that no one is looking out, and that in that space... Anyone can get away with anything. The big question then is how that translates into policy. And I think the big problem with broken windows theory is that it was translated into a policy that focused on the police. Broken windows, Patrick says, shouldn't be about cops policing, but about self-policing. When neighbors, community groups, and local organizations do the policing, the community reaps the benefits. That action of taking steps to make sure that public spaces are cared for in very visible ways, that has the potential to really maintain a community, to create stability, to make sure that it doesn't become a space where problems might emerge, uh, a space that becomes out of control, a space where violence can happen. The Dominican Center was making small changes to the environment where people lived and doing exactly that. I think there's been some focus on the environment, but limited. Charles Brannis is the chair of epidemiology at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. There could be some very important opportunities for preventing gun violence if we made actual changes to environments that are promoting it in the first place. When we think about gun violence from a public health perspective and compare it to an infectious disease, Charles says we often think in terms of hosts, agents, and vectors. It's an idea we've explored in prior episodes. But, Charles says, we should also be looking at the environment. As with the spread of disease, when looking at gun violence, changes to the environment matter. Others who come through the space also see that the space has been cared for and then will do likewise. And that spreads around that neighborhood. The neighbors don't want public drunkenness or some sort of disorderly conduct in these spaces, and they will 
ask those who are violating that this to move on or to not do that. Charles and a team of researchers conducted a 32-month study in Philadelphia where vacant or abandoned lots in neighborhoods throughout the city were selected at random and restored. The study found that not only did the neighbors' perception of crime, vandalism, and danger decrease after the lots were revitalized, but crime rates actually went down too. So if you do make a change to an environment, you gain the benefit of having it universally protect all those in that environment including those who are at high risk who cycle through the environment and those who are not. But Patricia points out that changes to the environment tend to work best if these changes are led by the community itself, because a community can only police what it controls. Just for an example, there was an empty lot. The city has been talking about beautifying these empty lots for a couple of years now. And so one empty lot, there were uh, fruit trees put on the empty lot. It's one of the things that the people really didn't want because it brings uh, raccoons and everything else. The city went ahead and planted fruit trees, and... The lot was beautiful. But? Nothing happened with those fruit trees. Uh, That, to me, was really a no-win situation. No one took care of them. They just went to waste. That was wasted money right there. What the community really wanted, according to Patricia, were basketball hoops for younger children who were too little to use the ones in the park. One man in the community did that with his lot. And it's used all the time. For me, that's the difference. In her experience, when programs are led by community members, not only do they better address the real needs of the neighborhood, but they're also more sustainable. There's a lot of money that comes into Omani, but the organizations, they never ask the community if it's what they want, if it's what they need, if it's being implemented in a way that's going to be sustainable. Those questions are never asked. People look at the statistics of this neighborhood and they say, aha, we know what you need. We're going to bring it in. And usually the programs last for three years, and then people are gone. The program's gone. Nothing else is happening because no one uh, in the community was really brought in and said, okay, you're going to lead this, and we're going to see how you want this money spent, what's the best way to do it, how to approach it, and what families really need with this. The center works because it encourages neighbors to get involved. You have to build relationships, first of all, and you have to be patient. You have to believe that the people know what they need and that they have the capacity to also do the things that's necessary for them to meet those needs. And by bringing people together, the Dominican Center helps create a sense of solidarity in Amani. Social cohesion is what happens when the people who use a space trust each other, when they believe that if something happens on that street, on that block, that their neighbors will step in. The community is encouraged to not only take ownership of its public spaces, their neighborhood, but also of its people. Parents and people have to work They have children that uh, have to go to school and do other things when they're not around. The village has to look out for those children. And we're in the shape that we're in now because the village has started to think that it's just my children that I have to be, have to look out for. And in a way, this idea of taking ownership of her space, of the people in her neighborhood, That's exactly what Serena Cotton wanted to do after the death of her son. It wasn't until Chris died that Serena began to notice how often young people were dying of gun violence. Her son Darius, the only one who hasn't been shot, wrote a song one day listing everyone he knew who had been shot. The song had 44 names. We still ended up saying, rest in peace, Maquisha has it. They killed Ariel. Serena created an organization called Rock the Peace, and every year on the anniversary of Chris's birthday, she organizes the Rock the Peace Festival. 
The festival brings the community of Rochester together. That's the rock in Rock the Peace. To honor victims of homicide and to promote peace throughout the community. You know, it's a day where we can memorialize our family members or friends or loved ones, I'll say. And it's a day where you can just enjoy yourself. I mean, it's free food. There's a, every, the whole thing is free. We have a stage where there's live entertainment and, and speakers and different organizations come together and be a part of this. Serena also visits schools and meets with students. She talks to them about her experience losing her son and listens to them talk about their own experiences with gun violence. What I notice with going into the schools and, and just speaking to people in general, we have a lot of angry children or young adults. It's like they're lost. So this is why I started a group for kids where um, it focuses on children that lost their parents or siblings to violence, either by death or prison. A lot of these young folks are losing their parents and their siblings, and they're angry, and they're taking their anger out on anyone. It's like they don't care. Violence prevention is most effective when it's in partnership with the community. That goes for, quote, hard law enforcement, the cops, or softer policing like social services and community-based organizations. But building these close ties is often easier for groups like Rock the Peace, the Dominican Center, and Becoming a Man than for the police. These groups often come from the community or are community-led. Neighbors get the services and supports they need. Which means the softer side has a competitive edge in getting community buy-in, which is what's needed to be most effective at curbing gun violence. And yet, these types of organizations have never had the sustained commitment that we as a nation have given to the criminal justice system and, and law enforcement uh, as a way to deal with violence. Historically, we've relied on the police and prisons to address the problem of violent crime, but there are limitations and consequences to that old school model. That is starting to sink in that we can't just continue to, to build prisons and imprison millions and millions of Americans as, as a way to deal with the problem of violence. That just doesn't work anymore. And the big challenge is, is generating sufficient support and sufficient commitment to really invest in these types of, of organizations uh, to deliver the next model to deal with the problem of, of urban violence. Patrick is an optimist because research shows these organizations play an important role in violence prevention. He looked at data from the early 90s when the rates of violence nationwide plummeted and onwards. This drop in violence is often attributed to massive growth in the criminal justice system. But Patrick's research shows there was another factor. We developed a method to identify the causal effect of the expansion in the nonprofit sector. It was also that residents mobilized and formed local community-based organizations. And what we found is that on average, now this varies by city, but on average across the country, every 10 of these organizations reduces the level of violence by somewhere between 6 and 9 percent. Patrick hopes his research will help us see that soft power works and that community organizations and social services are worth the investment. I don't argue in favor of funding for community organizations instead of the police. I'm actually arguing for new investment, large-scale investment to deal with violence, and that should take multiple forms. I do think we need extensive investment in law enforcement to do their job differently. Police are, can be very effective in confronting violence, but there has to be extensive training in how to create strong relationships with communities to build trust, to build legitimacy, but we need those investments to make sure that law enforcement can do their job differently than they've done in the past. The role of law enforcement, that'll be next time on In Sickness and in Health. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Virginia, Laura, and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. If you enjoy the show, please tell a friend about it today. 
And if you haven't already done so, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. You can learn more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health.